announcements. We will be having a men's meeting after services this evening. I'd like to welcome our guests back. Please stand for me. And first song going to be 543. And also, let's keep Sister Nancy in our prayer as well. She wasn't feeling well for the second service. 545. second and fourth. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels welcome me from heaven's open door. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh Lord, before the opening of prayer, 643. 643. We'll do the first, second, and fourth as well. 643. When a song like fills you are tempted tossed, when you are discouraged,
come here and to give thanks for your son, Jesus Christ, who went to the cross for our sins. I ask you at this time as we come to you in prayer that you would forgive us of any sins of anything that we have committed that may have separated us from you. And your love and promises of what they call heaven or home. Pray for those who couldn't be here. Be with Sister Nancy, Brother Joseph, Brother Dale, as they're going through health situations in their lives. Pray that you be with their caretakers as well, that you will give them the knowledge to treat those symptoms that they're dealing with. Give us strength as well to continue to hold on steadfast to thy word as we go about everyday lives here on earth. Thank you as well for our visitors. Be with us throughout the service here this evening that we will take attendance to thy word. Let the brother be Brandon through Charles continue to sisters across the world that we continue to build one accord. Be with us personally, the battles that we face daily here on earth. Four to five. song, it'll be 674. 
six, seven, four would be the rotation song. And some for the scripture reading will be seven oh two. Then we have scripture reading by Brother Luke. Seven oh two. Scripturing will come from Matthew 5, 2 through 12. Matthew 5, 2 through 12. And he, this is Jesus speaking, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do not hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. 
Blessed are the peacemakers, they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness and sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you, and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Continue our lesson in the Beatitudes, as we commonly call them. We had already started the first one. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And as we started this the last time, we introduced this as when we follow the Beatitudes, they help us to be more faithful. And uh, when we look at uh, verses 3 through 5, uh, this is the beginning of faith. Verse 6 is the development of faith. 7 through 9 is the perfection or completing of faith. And then 10 through 12 is a trial of faith. And we know that we must live by faith. And a lot of uh, people in the religious world use living by faith, um, usually out of context, uh, but we must live by faith. Romans 1.17, Galatians 2.20, Galatians 3.11, and Hebrews 10.38. And we talked kind of about what that means last time. But uh, in order to live by faith, we must understand the Beatitudes, and these can help us live better by faith. So we're going to look this evening at the second one, verse 4. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. And I believe that here in the context of what Jesus is saying in these verses, that he's saying like Solomon, there's a time to mourn, and there's a time to rejoice. There are certain things we should mourn. And certain things we should not mourn. And that's what we're going to look at this evening is some of the things, not all, this is not an exhaustive list, but some of the things we should mourn and some of the things we should not mourn. Um, but again, it's a time, there, are, there is a time to mourn and a time to rejoice. Notice again uh, verse 12. He says, rejoice and be exceeding glad. He's referring to something else there, but... Um, he doesn't want us to remain in mourning. There is a time to mourn and a time to rejoice. We'll get to Solomon, obviously, later on. Um, but let's begin this lesson, if you would. So our first point, what and when should we mourn? In our culture, just like in the first century today, there are people that mourn loss. And there's all kinds of loss that people mourn. It is appropriate to mourn when we lose loved ones. Even Jesus mourned the loss of a loved one. Let's go to John chapter 11, if you would. And Jesus specifically says that Lazarus was a friend. And how close our friends are depends on how close we let them be. But Lazarus was a close friend to him. And we're going to see how close Lazarus was to Jesus. And how close we let our friends be depends on each and every one of us. Lazarus uh, was a close friend to Jesus. John chapter 11, verse 11 says this. These things said he, being Jesus, are, and after that he saith unto them, Our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go that I may awake him out of our sleep. 
He's telling them that Lazarus was a friend, but we'll notice here how close of a friend that Lazarus was to Jesus. Let's get down to verse 34, if you would, of John chapter 11. And again, Jesus said, Where have you laid him? They said unto him, Lord, come see. Jesus wept. Jesus wept for his friend, Lazarus. Then said the Jews, Behold how he loved him. And some of them said, Could not this man which opened the eyes of the blind have caused that even this man should not have died? Jesus therefore again groaned in himself, cometh to the grave. It was a cave and a stone lay upon it. This Greek word for groaning is actually pretty interesting. It means to grumble. And he was kind of um, speaking inside his head in a way, um, the, the way that this Greek word represents. Um, kind of like some of us do. Uh, but this was a way that Jesus was moan, or, uh, mourning. He was mourning for the loss of Lazarus. Now, some of us have different ways of mourning. Jesus was kind of, in a way, upset at the way that these people were speaking. We've kind of seen this before in some ways. Was, I don't think that he was necessarily angry at them. But why did Jesus allow Lazarus to die? In the context, if you've studied this before, we know that he did it to show the power of God. Because he was going to raise Lazarus from the dead. These people didn't understand that. They didn't believe that. But he knew what he was doing. But he was groaning and mourning the loss of of his friend. And this is the way that Jesus did it. And he wept. Jesus wept. This wasn't the only time that Jesus cried. Jesus cried over Jerusalem because he knew that they were lost. But Jesus mourned over his friend. So we can mourn over lost loved ones. And we'll talk here in just a little bit about how long that should last and how long the other ones that we'll look at should last too. But we can also mourn over lost souls. We know that there are different kinds of lost souls. There are those who have never obeyed. No, those who uh, have never heard the gospel or those that we have preached to and have just simply never obeyed. And then there are those who have obeyed the gospel and have turned away. There are different kinds of lost sheep. In Luke chapter 15, if you'd like to turn there, Jesus kind of sums them up according to the context here. He sums both of these up in one as all lost sheep. Luke chapter 15, verses 4 and 6. We'll back up here to get some context here. Let's go back to verse 1 of Luke chapter 15. Then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. And he spake this parable unto them, saying, What man of you, having an hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, <coughs> excuse me, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety, ninety and nine, or ninety-nine, in the wilderness, and go after that which is lost until he find it. And when he hath found it, he layeth it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. And again, there's two ways that we can look at these lost sheep. Who created our souls? God did. Where do our souls go when we die? Whether we have been redeemed or not, they go back to Him because they belong to Him. 
Now, that does not mean on Judgment Day everybody's going to heaven. But they will return to God on Judgment Day. And they will stand before him and give an account. All souls belong to God. But what he is referring to is those that are lost and one comes back. Or he finds this lost soul. One that is redeemed out of the 99. So this could be those that are not redeemed at all and one that um, comes and obeys. Or this could be one out of the ones that have been redeemed and falls away and comes back. Either way we're looking at it, he's saying he's going to leave all the ones that are faithful and he's going to go find even that one that is lost just to find one lost sheep. We should mourn sin and we should go find that one. We spoke in class or in, uh, in the lesson this morning, yeah it was class this morning, James chapter 4, we read this one. Um, Brother Earl read this verse, and let's go there if you would, James chapter 4. This is speaking of ourselves individually, not just those around us. I didn't have this one uh, planned out because uh, this is one that we mentioned in class. But James chapter 4, verses 8 and 9, so you might add this to your notes. James chapter 4 verses 8 and 9 says this, Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted, and mourn, and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning, and your joy to heaviness. Again, there is a time to mourn. If we have sin in our lives, we need to be cleansed. We need to be purified. That is a time to mourn. We need to get rid of that sin in our lives. So sin is a time to mourn. Because we should not have sin in our lives. Paul talks about this in Galatians. If there is sin among our members, and uh, then we should try to get rid of that sin so that we don't fall into that same trap. And that's not being busybodies difference. So next, when or how long do we mourn? Well, if we're talking about the loss of a loved one, I'm not going to stand up here and tell you how long you should mourn, because that's not right for me to do. But I will say that it's not healthy physically or spiritually to mourn for long periods of time. As we said, there is a time to mourn and there is a time to rejoice. Let's go to Ecclesiastes chapter 3, if you would. Solomon was one of the wisest men on earth. I will, I will go ahead and say that outside of Christ, he was the wisest man on earth because God gave him wisdom. That's what he asked for as a king. He didn't ask for wealth. He didn't ask for anything else. He asked for wisdom to rule God's people. And that's one of the best thing you, things you could ask for as a king. He asked for wisdom. So in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, beginning in verse 1, he says this, To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under, the, under heaven. A time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck up that which is planted. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones. Or a time to gather, sorry. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to get and a time to lose. A time to keep and a time to cast away. A time to rend and a time to sow. A time to keep silence and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time of war 
and a time of peace. There is a time even for death. We don't know those times. There is a time for mourning, but there is also a time for rejoicing. Each person has to determine that time for themselves after this, their time of mourning. But again, it is not healthy physically or spiritually to mourn for long periods because God wants us to rejoice. He wants us to be happy. In order to turn our minds away from that mourning, he gives us things to do. He gives us work to do spiritually in his kingdom. Colossians 3 and verse 1, which we'll get back to Colossians here in a little bit, but he tells us to think on things above. Heaven is our spiritual home. So he wants us to focus on those things. Colossians 1 and verse 28, he tells us to preach and to teach. We've done lessons before where we know that public preaching is ordained for the men to do, but all of us as Christians are meant to be preaching and teaching everywhere about. There are specific places where even women are supposed to be teaching, whether that's to the younger women, to the children. We are all commanded to teach. 1 Thessalonians 5.17, this is one that is healthy, whether we're doing it with each other or alone in silence to get over mourning is pray. The specific words there in the King James is pray without ceasing. Have a mind of prayer. This helps us in all things, whether it's good times or bad times. Pray without ceasing. So however long that time of mourning is when it comes to the loss of a loved one, let's get our minds to work. Let's get our bodies to work physically for the Lord because that's why one reason why he has given us things to do. But focusing on heaven, preaching and teaching and praying are some of those things that he's given us to do. What about mourning for lost souls? How long do we do that? Well, again, there's two ways that we look at this because of the two types of lost souls that we have, those who have never obeyed and those that have turned away. Let's go to Matthew chapter 7, if you would. And most of us know this because of the judge not part of this that a lot of people take out of context. They always want to just look at verse 1 and stop. But there's also another verse here down further that kind of goes with what we're talking about here. Matthew chapter 7. And we'll go ahead and begin in verse 1 here. Matthew chapter 7. Judge not that ye be not judged, for with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged, and with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, Let me pull out the mote out of thine own eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye? Now we continue reading. Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. But we're not just talking about judgment here. We're talking about also being able to mourn and preach and teach. And how long do we do that? How do we mourn for sin? But we have to do work. Let's look at verse 6. Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet, and turn again and rend you. He's talking here in verse 6 about preaching and teaching and giving the gospel to others. Once we have cleared the sin out of our lives, and we are clear enough to preach and teach the gospel, and we have been preaching and teaching, and somebody rejects the truth, we cannot cast that which is holy, the gospel, our pearls, the treasure, before the feet of people who do not want it. We need to keep working and moving along. We can't mourn that sin so long that we reject and refuse somebody else who's willing to accept the truth. 
we need to keep moving on. We need to keep moving. So yes, we need to mourn sin, but we don't stay so long that we forget about somebody else who is willing to accept. We might come back to it later, but we don't cast our pearls before swine. We already mentioned Luke 15, 4 through 6, the one out of 99. We might go back again, like we said. 2 Peter 3 and verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The Lord is long-suffering. He's long-suffering to us. Do you know, Paul preaches that we, as God's servants, should be long-suffering as, as well. He does his long-suffering through each and every one of us. There is at least six times, and I could have missed, but there's at least six verses that say that Christians should be long-suffering in our preaching, our teaching towards each other and towards the world. Let's go again. I mentioned Colossians chapter 3. Let's go to Colossians chapter 3 now, if you would. Because this is one place that deals with ourselves, deals with each other as brethren, but also deals with the world. And he's giving them encouragement, but he's also giving them instruction. And I'll try to read through this quickly here because we still have another point to get to. Colossians chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. He's beginning with you focusing on yourself. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Now, for everybody else, but members is not necessarily the people here. Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanliness, inornate affection, evil concoctions, and er, con covetousness, sorry, which is idolatry, for which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience, in the which ye also walked sometime when ye lived in them. Ye is plural here. He's talking to everybody, not just Indivi one individual person. So he's not saying just focus on yourself, but all the members, all these things put away because you should have already put it away at one point in time. But now ye also put off all these things, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Why not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, now we're talking about everybody outside and within, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, the chosen, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, Kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long sufferings, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things, put on charity or agape love, which is the bond of perfection or perfectness, completeness. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name or authority of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. In verse 12, he tells us to be long-suffering. This is in our teaching, our preaching, as well as in our love, our kindness, 
everything that we do. And then verse 17, in all that we do, in word and in deed, do it by the authority of Christ. Truly blessed are those that mourn. Final point here, what and when should we not mourn? One thing that we should not mourn is the loss of that life or that old man before we obeyed the gospel. Let's go ahead and go to Romans chapter 6, if you would. And again, this is not an exhaustive list. There are several things that we could have in this lesson, but we don't have the time to go through a lot of things. So Romans chapter 6, we know that Paul is talking about baptism, the two sides of the spiritual world, sin or righteousness. Romans chapter 6, beginning in verse 3, Know ye not that so many of us, as were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism unto death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in his re the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. That old life, that old man is put to death, destroyed, cast away, and we have a new person that we're living with. A new body, or we should be, if we are resurrected correctly in Christ. We have a couple other, other verses here, Ephesians 4.22 that ye put off concerning the former conversation, behavior, manner of life, King James uses conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts. And then as we already read, Colossians 3, 9, lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off, cast away the old man with his deeds. We shouldn't mourn that old man. We shouldn't mourn him at all. We also should not mourn the loss of material things, the loss of money. Things in our, those things are going to happen. It's going to come up. I made a mistake the other day. Um, I went to go see my mom and uh, my pickup keys. I left them in the pickup and the pickup will randomly lock. And my brain doesn't always work sometimes and I called the locksmith instead of calling my wife. Now, my wife was an hour, about an hour and a half away. We would have had to have waited a long time, but it was a better choice to call my wife than calling the locksmith. I have never paid more than $60 for a locksmith. This guy came out, and he charged me $275. And I was like, well, you're already here. I don't know what else to do, and you've already done the deed, so... I paid the money, and it's one of those things where you just have to take a deep breath and move on. Money is money. We can't mourn those kind of things. And yes, it's tax season, so yes, we have money. Yes, we need that money for other things, but you just have to move on. It's going to happen, and it was a mistake. Matthew 6, 25 through 34, I'm not going to take the time to go and read this, but Jesus tells us he's going to provide for us. What do we need to put first? The kingdom first. Now there's two ways that we can look at the word kingdom because there's two ways it's used and defined in the New Testament, and that's heaven and the church. Either way we use it here, we need to put the kingdom first because if we put anything else first, we're making other things an idol. We don't need to worry about those other things God will provide for us. We don't need to worry. Something else we should not mourn or be devastated about is when the wicked gain victories. Genesis chapter 3 verse 15 we read about the prediction, the prophecy, I prefer the word prophecy, I don't know why I said prediction, but the prophecy of Christ dying on the cross. If we go there, 
Yeah, let's, let's just go ahead and read that. we got some time here. I know we're running low on time, but Genesis chapter 3, I apologize on the time. Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. And God is giving out the punishment to Satan, the serpent, who um, allowed Satan to use its body, and then man and woman as well. Genesis chapter 15, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, and shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. He's talking about the cross. This was a seeming victory on that day when Christ died for Satan. Christ died. It was like Satan had won. Hebrews 10 verses 10 through 13 tells us that Christ is sitting where? At the right hand of the Father. He is risen. He is ruling. We know that ultimately Christ will gain the victory. I want to read this one last passage from the text. And then we'll begin to wrap this up. 1 Thessalonians 5. Thessalonians chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. But of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as when? A thief in the night. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren... Are not in darkness that 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 day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober or clear-headed putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for an helmet, the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also ye do. Sometimes the wicked are going to get political victories in our country. They're going to get victories over us individually in life, persecuting us. But we know that Christ is coming again to take his home. Christ will have the ultimate victory. These minor victories are going to seem as nothing. 1 Peter 4, verses 12 through 13, Peter says, Beloved, Think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. Truly blessed are they that mourn. If you would be a woman or man of faith, you must begin here. We must understand that there is a time to mourn and a time to rejoice. We must understand some of these things that are appropriate to mourn and some things that are appropriate not to mourn. I challenge you to study this topic a little bit further. Again, this was not an exhaustive list, but a place to begin, an idea of where to begin on some things to mourn and what not to mourn. If you are watching online, um, as far as I understand, most of us here uh, this evening have obeyed the gospel, but um, the invitation is offered. Romans 10, 17 tells us that we must hear God's word, and it brings about faith. And faith is important. Hebrews 11, chapter 6 tells us, 11, verse 6 tells us that it's impossible to be pleasing to God without faith. Acts 17 and verse 30 tells us that the times of ignorance God once winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. In Acts chapter 8, 
we see the example of the Ethiopian eunuch. And when he came upon water, he wanted to be baptized, and Philip told him he could if he believed. And he made that confession of faith. He said, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And then in verse 38, Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch both went down into the water showing that baptism is an immersion. And in Revelation 2 and verse 10, we see that we must live faithful unto death. If you need, anybody here needs to come forward to confess of a public sin. This is not to shame anyone, but we know that um, it is something that is done by example as well. But if you need to come forward to confess of a public sin, to uh, make right with the church, or if you need to uh, have prayers of the church, whatever your need may be, you can come forward as we stand and as we sing. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in His grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you walking? Savior's side, are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Do you rest each moment in the crucified? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Lay aside the garments that are stained with sin and be washed in the blood of the Lamb. There's a fountain flowing for the soul unclean. Are you washed in the blood? time we give opportunity to what brother David to take over Lord's Supper this morning that you come forward as we stand and sing 5-2 and we ask this time to remain standing until the church prayer. 5-2. Go to closing song 500. After this, we have a closing prayer. Brother Steve, our closing prayer. 500. Take the name of Jesus with you, child.
Our Father in heaven, we're so thankful, Lord, that you've been with us throughout this hour of worship. We pray that you will continue to be with us throughout this week. First off, we pray, Lord, that you'll be with those that weren't here with us this evening, that they make it, may make it back to us at the next appointed time. We thank you for the love that you have for us. We thank you for your only begotten Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus. And as Christians, we know if he hadn't given himself up to the cruel cross that our hope for eternity and our faith in in that happening would be in vain. We pray that we have taken the word that was preached to us and studied this morning or this evening to heart, that we be able to take it home with us and study it further so that our strength may may grow and that we'll be able to bear the cruel world outside these walls for the next week, knowing that you are with us always. We pray, Lord, that you will once again forgive us if we fall short. We pray that you will give us the strength and the wisdom to recognize our failings. We pray that you'll be with us as we head home this evening, that we all make our destination safely. For it's in Christ's holy name that we pray. Amen. 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 